A warm welcome to today's episode of The Human Project. I have the big pleasure to have not only my second Zoom interview, but also an amazing guest here on my show. It's Daisy Gideon. Thank was you. Correct? Yeah, lucky That's me. Great. Very Thank good. You. Such an honor to have you here. Really, thank you so much for your time. You Thank are right you. now, Daisy, you're based in Beirut. Me, myself, I'm here today in Berlin. And um, you're an amazing woman. I spoke with Ronnie, a common friend, a friend of ours. I met in Beirut about you. And while I was doing my research on the internet, I found out that you are not only a mother, you're a film director, you're a journalist, you're an activist. And I love that. The world needs more activists, I think so, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You're a writer, you're a world lover. Yeah. What, what else did I miss? You're a producer, you're a filmmaker, of course, and this is what we would like to touch today here. Yeah. How would you continue that list? What else are you? What are your key characteristics? Well, on the human side, I'm, you know, the daughter of amazing parents. It's, it's, oh, sweet. Um, a sister who have been tremendously supportive and um and friend i'm a friend of everyone like i really try to position my life so that i can serve people and even with my business my marketing agency in australia people who work for me uh work within my company um i like to give them all a voice and respect and recognition because my base belief is we are human first and it doesn't matter what color or what level of education or what amount of money you have um, you know you are contributing to this life to this world and and I want to be a friend first and then an employer or a mother or whatever um, And I see the world that way. I don't think I'm better than anyone else. I just, I just believe in my, my, my drive. It's my, you know, this um, in, intuition to follow my own course in life. Mm. And this gives me great serenity. Mm. I think... Um, A lot of people don't understand how I can do so many things and be very driven and work till 2 a.m. in the morning and then get up very early if I have to keep going to, it's just non-stop. There's no sit down, have a break, like for hours. Of course, I'll have a break and have lunch, you know, whatever, but um, my head's always moving because I have a mission. I honestly believe that my life has is driven by purpose mm. thank you so much and accept my apologies because i miss the businesswoman that you are okay. as well that's okay that life is driven by purpose and um i think one purpose might be please correct me to change the world to make it better mm. It's a big purpose. <laughs> it's a very big purpose. It's a very big purpose and it's a very powerful one. I think this was maybe one of the drivers why, that led you to a movie project that is called Enough, Lebanon's Darkest Hour, that I was informed about during my own stay in, in, in Beirut in July this year. So maybe you can build the bridge for us. First of all, why that purpose? Why would you say you are driven by this purpose? And to what extent is it then leading to your latest film project? Mm. Um, so the gentleman you met, Ronnie, is the producer of the documentary. And he's been a friend of mine for more than 20 years. Um, and he's also an actor and a writer. And so when this film came along it this idea came along um it didn't come along because there was an opportunity to make a film to make money or film to do something it came along and and it came along out of a 
calling. It was a whisper in my ear. It was 2015, I was struggling significantly with building my business. I was uh, divorced, I just got separated and was going through a very tumultuous separation with my ex-husband, going through courts. My kids were still young, trying to make my business grow. And this whisper started in 2015 and it, the whisper became noise, loud screaming noise in my head in 20, until, until 2016 when I decided, okay, I'll do it. The whisper was it's time to go back and make a film, the time to go back now to make a film about Lebanon. And until I made that decision in 2016, Despite all the issues going on around me, it was like I had to do it now. There was a reason I had to start now. The noise continued. And then when I made the decision, it stopped. So I didn't know what I thought. I, you know, obviously I go to Lebanon back and forth, but I didn't know what the story was. So my only decision was that I had to come. I had to go and things would... Mm -hmm reveal I had to create a plan and get a you know do my research and get a crew and that's when you know Ronnie and I were friends as I said for 20 years and I told him and he was the first one to jump on board to say I'll go I'll help you I'll be there I'll you know he he had connections and um, so he came ahead and helped set things up for interviews and stuff and and, you know, we're still great friends and he's like my little brother and he just believes in the story too. Like, I, they kept saying, what's the story? And it's, I said, I don't know yet because it was a matter of coming, talking to people and letting the story tell, tell me what the story is. So people tell me. So that's where the purpose driven comes and the... Connection back to my, my, my mission of making the world a better place, you know, changing the world one story at a time. I think, um, I think when you get clear on your purpose or your mission or your, you know what you're good at, I'm good at telling stories and writing. I think the universe then delivers the method and the, and the message for you. It's, being confident in what you're, what you are good at, and acknowledging it, and then the universe will show you how to walk, how to deliver the purpose that you're meant for. I like the idea about the universe a lot because I think this is an idea we share. I also believe that you have uh, a lot of possibilities in your life to find your way in life. There are so many opportunities you have to go for them. And the universe is giving you gifts and you can take them. Of course, there's always, for me at least, a factor you cannot influence. It's how yeah. you call it. There is a factor I at least cannot influence. But there is so much to do. And I think we people forget about the space we can take place, the place we can adjust. And coming, speaking to regarding a place, I was wondering because... We could hear you clearly, but I think the um, image got frozen. Maybe if you wouldn't mind, you maybe feel invited to put your laptop back where we talked before our interview. I think there was a better spot because it was not getting frozen that much. Thank you so okay. much, Daisy. And for the listeners, Daisy is right now in Beirut and her movie is also telling about the current situation in Lebanon. We spoke about it. It hasn't changed since I was there two months ago. The situation mm. is the following. Um, electricity is cut. Yeah. And getting petrol is really a pain because you sometimes have to queue. At least this is what I did for something like four, five, six, seven hours. And then at the yeah. end, you get only maybe petrol from the black market. So again, thank you so much. Um, I hope it's a bit better from that position. And um, going now back to what you said yeah. before, the purpose-driven, the co-work um, that you did with Ronnie about the movie. When I was in Beirut, I received suddenly a lot of messages from my friends and colleagues in Beirut 
um, sending me the link to your movie. This was such a coincidence because just an hour later, I met Ronnie down in our hotel <laughs> in Beirut. And then I asked, oh, what are you doing? And he told me about the movie and I said, I can't believe it. Look here, I have four messages linking it all to the YouTube uh, clip um, about your movie project. Wow, and wow. And I was captured by the first second. So tell us, what is your movie about? You said like you, you could feel there was the idea to create something, to make a movie. Maybe I have to explain also how Lebanon is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, how Lebanon is, um, is working. You have a very high number of um, diaspora. It's the same like in Armenia where I was earlier this year. I think you have something between 14 and 16 million diaspora, meaning like people that are very, very linked to the country, they are Lebanese but they are living abroad. They are living in Australia, as you usually do in the US, or I have friends that are diaspora members and they live in Paris. So they live abroad, 14 to 16 millions, and I think you have less than 10 million people living in Lebanon. 4.5 million Lebanese plus 2 million refugees. Yes, yeah, another subject. And there is a lot of money transfer coming from abroad to support those that are still living home. At the same time, yeah. the diaspora people do have voting rights. And there is the election, the upcoming elections next year in 2022 in Lebanon. Yeah. So yes. this circle now, what is your movie about, Daisy? So my film, is a call to arms. It's a call to action. It's, um, it, it's actually not a movie, it's a movement. It's not just for Lebanese, it's for any people and all people to realize the power within our hands and the abdication of responsibility that we undertake when we fail to vote when we fail to step up and, and, and make our voice heard, even if we think it's not going to make a difference, we are engaging in the process for change or at least having a say. When we don't vote, we sit on the sidelines, we are cheerleaders or we are um, whingers, whiners and whingers and have no responsibility or right to complain when we don't vote. So I say that because I know you mentioned Germany's coming up for elections too and, and there's a lot of apathy. And in, a, in Lebanon, the apathy is, it reached a level of, of ridiculousness. Well, say it was always around 50% of the population that voted. The last election, 49.7. So, you know, and, and yet everywhere I go, every single person I speak to from the Bacar Valley to the northern areas, uh, northern heights of Lebanon, all throughout Beirut and everywhere, south everywhere, they hate the situation there. They are beyond, like they've, they're just beaten. They're just surviving. They're barely surviving. And they understand their responsibility. They are very clear how they failed to vote. They're very clear how, or how they voted for these people that are doing this to them, inflicting this suffering upon them. So those who voted understand how they failed and those who didn't vote understand how they failed. So this movement, this movie movement looks into the, it explores in a subplot, not the main plot, but the subplot, it explores the journey of how we, here, we reached here mm -hmm. and how people, because I've filmed it over five years and how people were fine in 2017. They were whinging, but they were not ready to take up arms and vote. Very few people were ready to do that. The elections were in 2018. 
but the story tells how, especially follows one person who in 2018, 2017, 2018, wasn't going to vote, didn't want to vote, not interested, it's too far away. And coming back round to today mm -hmm. and how difficult life is and people realising that they have to, they have to stand up and they have to vote. So this is a very important theme in the film. It's not the only theme in the film, but it's a critical theme because of where Lebanon is today and we have elections in May next year and the people are at the point of, there's so many people who are abandoning Lebanon, leaving. They're trying to get passports. The government has run out of paper to produce passports, to produce IDs, to produce anything, because everyone's gone. They're abandoning ship, they've had enough. Mm -hmm. So this is a critical story about it within the film. But the film also explores Lebanon and this important role that it's had in history, historically, its place in the world. It's been around for seven, eight, nine thousand years. It's seen so much and it's overcome so much. And you know, maybe in a hundred years we'll look back and this was a blimp in history. But right now for what the people are going through, it's very tragic. It's it's, they just, they don't get to live their lives. They don't have the opportunity to express who they are. They only get one life. And so I don't blame them for leaving. I don't blame them for wanting to send their children. And that's why you have nearly 16 million outside Lebanon. They've just, what do I want to stay here for and suffer? This is so, exactly what I received as a feedback. Like I was asked, what are you doing here? I mean, if I could, I would just leave. And then yeah. I met on the other side, the diaspora, friends of mine, just coming back to Beirut for a couple of weeks and months. And for them, I was always assuming it's easier because they know they have the ticket to leave. They have another yeah. life. So for them, yeah. it's easier to say they love the Lebanon. And yeah, you can feel their emotional attachment. But at the same time, when you speak to those the taxi drivers, and those who are living on the ground, the bakery guy, you can feel how desperate they are. Yeah. And I told you up front, my experience, and I've traveled to a few countries in the world, I have never been to a country that is so, I have to say it now here, fucked up. It's maybe I was, after I left the country, I was thinking about why I felt that way. And maybe it was because you could feel structure back in, in Lebanon, that is so familiar to my home country. You could see like shops that you can usually see in Paris, yeah, close to Champs Elysees, like Chanel, Hermès. So you could feel that it was once a really well developed country and now no electricity. I think with the water, you have a water supply issue as well. You have to collect water in the morning because it's just running for one hour a bit and then you have to have it dry water on top of your roof, yeah. Then I think there is hunger has started when I was in Lebanon in, the, in one part of Very much. Then those refugees that went to the border of Syria, I went to the camps and there were even like people from Lebanon that were refugees. I mean, you can barely believe it, right? And I think the image that still strikes me the most is that you went into, when you went into the, or when I did go to the government area of Beirut, they locked themselves in. Is this a democracy, I'm asking? I have never seen this. I mean, it was not new, but there were walls up to four or five meters, well protected from military and police forces, a large area in downtown of Beirut. So you have a government that is locking themselves in. And actually, yeah. I didn't even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had a clue where to start to clean it up. So for those who are not so familiar with uh, Lebanon, I think this full history of where we are right now, and I think one trauma is corruption. It's the political yeah. elite. And it goes yeah. back maybe even to something like 40 years. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah. What would you say, you who is so much more familiar with the whole situation than I am, why could it develop like this? Again, it is said to be a democracy. 
you have mm -hmm. Hezbollah. Don't forget the Hezbollah. Yeah, that is yeah. the second military in the country. Mm. Yes. So, yes. where would you see the biggest drivers also to learn? Yeah, for other countries to not make the same mistakes. It was or is mm -hmm. democracy. So, where would you say are the leakages or the weaknesses of the country of the system? Well, this is this is what I I see because as a journalist working and living outside. I look at Lebanon and I see things that are so familiar. They're not unique. Lebanon's problems are not unique. They're everywhere. But the, the, the extent, the degree of corruption, the degree of complacency, the de degree of turning a blind eye, which we do everywhere in every society. It happens all over the world. But the fact that this is a tiny country, it's a very small country. The fact that in Lebanon there was those warlords and we went through a civil war and so many people lost people. The, um, it, there are compounding reasons why Lebanon and the Lebanese allowed the mismanagement the de dereliction and the degradation of the infrastructure because they didn't want to fight. They didn't want to go back to war. And then you had, of course, Lebanon is a tiny country whose border is with Israel and Syria. So you have all of these Middle Eastern countries who want to control the border with Israel. So there's a lot of influence from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, you know, as you mentioned, supporting Hezbollah. Saudi Arabia supports the Sunnis. Um, you have other countries before. You had Iraq in the 80s supporting different groups. Mm -hmm. There is a reason. And then you have America and Russia still playing a game in, in Lebanon because, because of that threat, because Lebanon has that border with Israel. It's a threat to Western, to Western nations, but Lebanon has no desire, never, ever invaded Israel, never, ever, um, you know, engage in any battle with Israel, ever. Let's be clear, Lebanese army never engaged in battle with Israel. The only people who engage in battle with Israel is the Hezbollah fighters, in the, in the beginning, in, the 19, in 1982, after Israel invaded, and they created Hezbollah out of their occupation. And I'm not justifying Hezbollah, I'm just giving fact. But today, Hezbollah is a political party. It has a militia, and it is, like you said, a second army. And this is a major problem because the Lebanese army has no control over them. That Lebanese army are in talks with Israel to resolve border issues. Uh, Israel, uh, but, but Hezbollah is, it's control, it controls itself. It has Iran and it has Syria, and they are very big, powerful partners, which makes the Lebanese army very deficient. And then, you know, we're delving into a bit of politics now, but, um, um, you know, the, you'll never get out of there. But the reality is that there are political parties within Lebanon who choose to, to stand alongside Hezbollah because it gives them power. And they've created a block. And I'm not saying Hezbollah's bad. There's, a, there's enough Lebanese political parties already that are terrible, worse than Hezbollah, and they still exist. In, in reality, what needs to happen is that Hezbollah's arms, its militia needs to be disbanded. And if Hezbollah like, wants to be a political party, it should be like any other militia that, that protected a country. Like in Northern Ireland, you had the Sinn Féin, you had other militias that turned and became political parties and now part of the political system. In Colombia, you have the FARC who were for 30, 40 years, devastating and shocking Colombia. And four years ago, they reached agreement and surrendered their arms and became part of the political system. 
Lebanon and the Lebanese political parties never did that with Hezbollah. They should have handed in their arms in the 1990s, but for whatever reason, I, you know, we're not going to go into that now. They didn't. So this is a problem. This is a problem for us. So, you know, we, we can get into those conversations, but what happens when we get into those conversations is we lose sight of the humanitarian crisis that's happening on the ground. You know, when we argue about politics between people in corrupt leaders, this kleptocracy, like you said, have been here for 40 years, they have no desire to improve the country, no desire to relinquish their seats, no desire to do anything that helps their common man. All they have is a desire to serve their personal interests and to stay in power. So when you understand the animal or the enemy and the shape of the enemy, you have to deal with them in a different way. And my film is very important in this respect because the Lebanese in Lebanon know what's going on and have been aware of what's been going on. What my film does is deliver an argument, a narrative to the Western world, to a Western audience, to Lebanese in the diaspora who don't understand Arabic like me, can't sit here and decipher it, and has delivers a message that they can, that is palatable, that is understandable. The storyline is 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 um, chronological, so. It's, and then I weave together the, I find it took a long time and a lot of research and a lot of consideration and, and more than 200 interviews to create this film, to, to get an understanding, to do justice to the suffering and the story of the people. Before I, we go maybe into um, the movie, um, or the documentary itself. May I get back to one point? Like you said, how important humanitarian is. Yeah, like the people, like the humans. So, what would your suggestion be when you look on the history of Lebanon? To what mm. extent can we, you and me, and those around, can have an impact in how one? a country is, is, is left, how it is governed, yeah? What is missing? So if you would go back in the history, 40 years in Lebanon, what would be your suggestion to the people to say you have to take care because if not, there might be the risk that? Hmm. My advice, if I was able to go back in time, um, would be not to, to, to make sure that when you are deciding who you are going to vote for, because we have elections, throughout the war we didn't, it was a very difficult time, but when we got elections and when anybody in the world is going to elections to vote for somebody, make sure you know why you're voting for them make sure you know the responsibility of the role that they are going to fulfill. What the problem we have and we had was people were very loyal, very kind. Lebanese are very loving, kind, forgiving people, overly forgiving, overly, ridiculously. So this allowed them to let things past that they knew were wrong. And when, this is a life lesson. This isn't just Lebanon. This is a life lesson for everybody. I had to learn it in my business. I have to learn it every single day in life. If we allow people to get away with small, small things, we're giving them permission to get away with big things. This is a very good one, right? Because if you give to a child a little finger, it sometimes takes all. That's right. It, it's, it's simple and it's profound. And it is, if you take away anything from this interview today, 
please take away how critical it is for us not to not to permit the small mistakes call them out you don't have to be harsh about it you don't have to end the world we're not just saying destroy but identify that that wasn't appropriate that's not right please don't do that again call people out so that they don't get to the point where they're you've let them get away with it for one month three months six months five years when you are when you are up to here they say well what the heck you've been letting me do it for six years why is it a problem now who's the fault who's at fault we are at fault for allowing them when i listen to you and i so much like what you said there comes the idea to me like I think we do have a crisis of empowerment. Empowerment for yes. me starts within ourselves. Yes. And I can see, but maybe I'm wrong, but more and more people who would like to give away power because power means like you are responsible for yourself. And then if yes. it doesn't work, you have to say, oh, fuck, it was me. And people don't like it. They rather prefer sitting on their sofa, at least this is what I see here, and play mothers. Maybe we always did it. Maybe it's just now easier with all the social media and the digitalization and the transparency of the citizen because yeah, more and more data is going a certain way. Um, so for me, it's also a crisis about empowerment. And I have also to admit, no matter where I go, I can see this tendency. And again, I wouldn't exclude that it's just a false illusion and maybe it was before there and I just see it now. And I have asked myself very often the question, how can you give more power to the people? How do you make them enjoy that power? Because it's powerful and it's lovely to be responsible for yourself. Yeah? Yeah. So hmm. what would be your advice then to maybe those more than 90% of people, I would call it, who prefer to give away power, maybe mm. even to get kind of security in exchange. And then suddenly, as I personally thought it would be the case in Lebanon, you wake up and you say, oh, no electricity, no water. The money is gone because I think the government has cooperated with the banks as well. So all your saving is gone. I mean, that's terrible. Yeah. 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 So yeah. how do exactly. you, what do you, what, what is, because I don't have an answer to that. What would be yeah. your suggestion to empower each of us? The old lady living as a neighbor here, the, the, the man who's walking the, door, uh, the dog outside, even the younger ones, how can we provide them with more joy of being and feeling empowered? My question to everyone would be, why are you scared of failing hmm. why are you scared of getting in trouble who is going to get you in trouble are you did you get i mean look there are some people who grew up with very harsh parents mm -hmm. some people who grew up with a terrible teacher some people who grew up with or some people who grew up with parents who let them do everything or did everything for them so they didn't have any responsibility but i'll Ultimately, it comes back to what you said. They don't want to take responsibility because responsibility means taking, if it fails, taking ownership. Who the care, hell cares if you fail? I, every day I go, okay, I'm going to try. If I fail, I'm thinking about it. If I fail, this is the problem people don't do. People don't follow through and think about what is the worst thing that could happen to me if I fail today doing X. Okay, someone, the first thing, oh, someone's gonna yell at me. Oh, someone's gonna get, I'm gonna get into trouble. Okay, what happens if you get in trouble? Oh, you know, I might have to not do this or not do that. Okay, what happens if that doesn't happen? Like if you get into trouble, you can't go outside. You can't do this for one hour or two hours. You get into trouble whoop a dee doo what happens next? What's going to happen? Follow it through. Keep asking yourself what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what, till you exhaust the worst thing that could happen to you. It's not bad. It is not, you're not going to die. You're not going to get crucified. You're not going to get whipped to death. The worst thing is 
you might get your ego dented. Mm. And we need to get out of our head and our ego and get into confidence and doing what we want to do because when we don't do what we want to do, when we don't take responsibility, when we're led by the nose or by the ear, we are miserable people complaining about everything, feeling unfilled. We have anxiety. We have, um, you know, depression. We have suicide. We have all of these problems compounding because we are not fulfilling our own destiny. And it's our destiny. Time for may say so for all those depressed people, then there is a huge market for the pharma industry again, because yes. Capitalism has to find new markets when other ones are dying out. And yes. so I cannot agree more what you just said. If you go into different philosophies, even if you would call yoga, for example, a philosophy, you can feel that there is the idea of being awake. If you read yes. Ocho, he talks the same about getting out of your comfort zone. So yes. apparently there is enough information out for all of us to see the benefits of feeling self-empowered. But then comes maybe this just simple laziness of the human mind. Yeah. We just say, oh, I just turn on Netflix. Yeah. And I jump into one of those series and I escape the real life. It's too complex. So but they're not living. But they're not living. This is not living their life. This is being a bystander. This is being an observer. You have one life to live. You have been brought with a will, a spirit to But David, your... don't you think if you look around in your environment, um, and I don't want it to be understood as arrogant or something superior, no, but how many people do really live their life, right? I mm. mean, how it's many tragic. people even dare to be happy? Yeah, I mean, there yes. must be a reason why in the news you can rather see like bad and negative ones than mm. like inspiring positive stories yeah so is there a certain tendency towards misery sometimes and why do you think we have that if so because, oh, look i um i can only you know hazard a guess and i think it's because it's easy it seems easy. It seems easy in the beginning because, yes, turning on a TV, getting up and going for a walk and doing some exercise, um, eating this, you know, cake instead of cooking something healthy. It's in everyday life. It's our entire life. But it depends on how you are brought up. It really does, you know, how, um, you know, people here are dying to live. They want to live. They want to live their life. And they missed, and especially the young people who are getting the hell out of here, they, they say, I'm not giving up on my life. They're, they're, they're working three jobs. They're kicking their ass. They don't have time to watch TV. They will watch some TV. They will participate in some social media. But the reality is they've woken up now. They, they, got, they, like, they love life. Lebanese love to sit around, talk, eat, drink. It's a celebrate. It's unbelievable what happens in the streets at night, yeah. Yeah, and they're still, and this is the only way that they're able to, they're like schizophrenics, you know, they've got to, they've got to get some sort of enjoyment to be able to deal with the realities on the ground. And like the rest of the world, you know, people in France, in Germany, in Australia, in America, they are slowly waking up. You see all these civil rights movements and actions and, you know, they just, they, they just need to keep going. They just need to get a plan, not just go for a protest march and think something's going to happen from it. Like, there are... So wait, keep your thought now. Electricity is not again. It's not bad. Daisy, just wait a second. Can you repeat your last point? We, we lost okay. you. Now I Sorry, think am I back? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not all so bad. I mean, like the world, there are a lot of good people. There are a lot of amazing organizations that are working for good. Now, we, we can't 
and and there's a lot of a lot of people with a lot of drive um, but the we do have to make sure we don't let people get comfortable you know like you said life begins at the end of your comfort zone I'm not sure who wrote that quote but life does being well, you're not living you're just existing you're just treading water you're not testing pushing you know pushing the edge of that envelope and you have to follow the dream that is within you everyone has to follow the dream within them even if it's a little bit the joy and the energy and the adrenaline they will feel is a thing that they you know they just they won't ever want to go backwards but people get beaten down and talked out of their 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 vision their dreams people what do you want to do that for what do you want to, oh, what, that's very risky oh that's you know you can't do that why would you do that they get talked out of it by their friends and their peer group and their in you know, a family who are oh just do this this is safe this is secure keep this job you've got this job why don't you do this job it's safe safe you know i know some people need safety but we we not everyone and i think that the re, the sadness is that more people are opting out of life and opting out of living and fulfilling their dreams and their purpose and i think that's why you're impressed with me and i'm like i i'm fulfilling my purpose but i'm actually just living the life i was given that's all i'm doing i'm not doing anything special you know and one might think that humanity has never been so close and really living each other each one's purpose because there is so much technology out and i'm sometimes wondering why are people really like working so hard because shouldn't it like the purpose of a lot of industries be like to make life easier so that maybe people have time to do what they really love to do i mean there must be a kind of an improvement in humanity right also in that regard yeah um yes but listening while i was listening to you um another mind came it flew in i would say you are really like a human activist right you have your passion you know what you're fighting for and i can totally understand why people are fascinated by your personality and also while talking to you here in this conversation i can feel your power your energy your motivation and that um brings me to my thought um, what we just said a large part of humanity prefers maybe security, prefers laziness. Yeah. Where do you build the bridge for yourself to say, I wouldn't say sacrifice, but to put in so much effort in this kind of battle to wake people up? Because maybe some of them feel very comfortable where they are because getting out of this is the kind of uncomfortability. So why don't you care for horses cats or dogs instead of humans so where is this kind of love for the humans coming from i love animals i love i've got two dogs and i love animals i love cats i love horses <laughs> um, it was a wrong yeah. example the, the, the reality is that when you're filled with love i think oprah winfrey once said this when she was talking she said you know my cup runneth over it's a bit of a, a oh, bit of like, my cup runneth over like there's no end to the love or the giving or the it's it's not like i've got a limited amount of time a limited time of, of desire or passion or will i don't i just i get re-energized by what i do because I believe that it's ever flowing. So, and if I fail, I don't care. When, when I think I, the only reason I would feel I failed is if I don't stand up and do something. I'm not, I'm not failing in anything I do. I tried, at least I got that much further along the way. 
to me, there is no failing. In life, there is no failing. People should just get rid of that word. There's only trying and then there's growing and then there's learning and then there's exploring and then there's wow and then there's, oh, that wasn't so good. Okay, let's try that. There's no failure. It's just, okay, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Let me try it this way. That's all it is. We have to change our definition. If we changed our perspective and said, okay, it did, I'm making a cake. Okay, I tried and it didn't work. It fell or whatever. It didn't rise as big. I tried. It doesn't matter. You still tried. It's not a failure. You try again. Um, what was it? Uh, Thomas Edison. The great line about Thomas Edison, 997 times he tried to make electricity, light bulb turn on. If he gave up after 900 times, we wouldn't have electricity. Mm. He just kept going. He knew it was possible. And this is how we have to be, you know. You, when you start something you believe in or you like or you're interested in, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like you're... you're you know, oh, draining yourself, even though you might be physically exhausted, because you feel like you're 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 doing something. You're contributing. Mm -hmm. And contribution, when you start something where you believe you're giving, and you come from that level of contribution and service, you just feel like you want to do more. I don't care. People say to me, "It's my cousin said to me." Like, are you crazy, Daisy? Why would you spend money, your money, to make this film about Lebanese and half of them are idiots? Sorry to say. Um, why would you try? They're like crazy. Go put your money in something else. I said to him, I have the opportunity to invest in something I truly believe in. And I would want to pursue. And I feel I can contribute to I want to do it why wouldn't I do it money is a, you know is a means to serve money okay I could go and hire a yacht and 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 coast down the Riviera for six months with the amount of money I probably put in the film but what is that for like I'm trying to do something that is historic that is transformational educational I believe is important and I want to give. It's never going to disappear. That holiday is over if I, you know, just spend it on a holiday. I still enjoy that holiday and I love going on holidays, but this is something I can't deny. I don't want to not do. I want to do it. And the reaction of people since the small group that have been exposed to the film so far they're amazed by the story, amazed, whether they're Lebanese, German, French, Greek, um, from, you know, Dutch. They understand the mission of the, of the story. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that it took, oh, so long and such hard, hard work and such fear. Okay, I went through fear. You wouldn't believe. Like, I thought, what the, excuse my language, what the hell, who am I? Why would I know, think I know something to do this? We all go through this. And I had to go back and say, no, I can do the best I can and deliver the message that I believe I've been asked to deliver. And hopefully it helps some way and that's that's what we're all asked to do called to do is try try what what moves you don't try because it's going to make you more money over here only you can make money good luck to you and then over here do something that gives back you've got to give back there's got to be a balance and that's throughout all the ages that's what they teach us you know Work hard, be successful, be driven, and give, serve, and see the reward that you get. Oh, it's beautiful thoughts. Beautiful thoughts. Thank you.
Thank you. Wait, let me go back to the film, the documentary. Would you like to name it rather a documentary than a movie? Is it where we would be more comfortable? It, it's definitely a documentary. Um, people call it a movie. It's not a feature film, so there's no actors or actors in it. Um, a very, very special one, right? Because if I may say so, I did some research. So you managed somehow to get incredible guests as interviewed people in that. Like yes. you spoke to whistleblowers, like the former director general of the Ministry of Finance, Alain Bifani. I do not know yes. if it's pronounced correctly or not. Then you spoke to the ex prime minister, Saad Hariri. Yes. Then Mohamed Freif. He is the Hispanic no. Party member. How is Muhammad it? Fnaish. Muhammad Fnaish. Yeah. His name. And then you yeah. have even the Saint Bank Governor Riyad Salame, for example, in your documentary. So tell me, how did you manage to get those people that are pointing the also part of the issue, the problem, participating in that movie documentary? That let me just say yeah. so also won the Better World Fund and uh, the filmfestival.com movie award 2021 in Cannes, where you were just recently. That's so tell me, how, how did you do that to get all those um, key players featuring, being featured in the documentary? Like when I was mentioning before, when I started this film, I didn't know what the story was. So when we submitted requests to the governor of the central bank, the minister, the Hezbollah minister, the different, different ministers and, and people of key influence, I was, I submitted questions across a broad range of subjects and they approved them and it included issues in relation to corruption, but they weren't as big as the issue, the way it is now. So people, some of them were very, very hard to get into. Some of them we needed a lot of time, like with the Prime Minister, it took a year and a half to get an interview with him. Mohammed Fnaish, similarly, with the Hezbollah, we were trying to go to the very, very top, but he was a senior minister in the, in the government. So that took over 12 months, 16 months to get that interview. And that was the first interview they had given to a Western journalist in 12 years. And the Prime Minister's interview was the first interview to a Western journalist in four years or six years. Um, so we were very lucky. And I think, um, you know, I think I said to my crew when we started this film, like we had an ambitious list of interviewees. I said, look, we try, we do everything we can and we push and we keep trying and those who are meant to be in this film will be in this film. But we must try. We don't try once, we must try. Like with the president, President Aum, I tried 25, 30 times different people, any person with influence. Door was closed, firmly closed. Wally Jumblot, the Druze leader, who everyone says, He's the first person to get in front of a camera, very happy to sit down and talk to anyone. We tried many times. And Ronnie even met his wife and talked to his wife to try and get to Jumblat through his wife. No go. Nabi Berry, the Speaker of the House. All of these are very, very senior people, critical in where Lebanon is today and why Lebanon is suffering today. So those that were meant to be in the film were in the film. And we did have friends and supporters and people of influence who knocked on doors for us to open those doors. And this is where we, how we got those interviews, you know, it was, and we sat down, I sat down very professionally, very excitedly, as in I was very honoured to be sitting with them. I didn't know whether they were guilty or not. It's not my job to judge them before I have the right to interview them and then assess the facts. I was honest in, 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 with integrity, sitting with these people um, and, and asking them innocent questions. So I don't think there was any threat, although when I got to the Prime Minister, 
I had spoken to a lot of people by the time I reached the Prime Minister. So when I, I said to him, you know, a lot Lebanese in, in around the world and in Lebanon believe that you are part of a problem. He was a little bit, you know, that you are part of the corrupt group controlling change and preventing change. He, you know, he had a, it was a hard question to ask with everyone around, but I had to ask it. It was, why am I, why am I sitting in front of him if not to ask the question that everyone is saying? but scared to ask to him. I asked him. So that was a moment of intensity for me. Um, but, you know, it, it really, you can see it in the film when you see the full film, the response from the Prime Minister. And, um, you know, you just, like I was saying before, you've got to try. You've got to have a go. Mm. And that which is meant for you will be for you. It will did be. You, did you receive some feedback so far? I mean, the movie is not yet out, the documentary, I have not seen it. So did you receive yes. some feedback from um, senior politicians in Lebanon, from the government side on your movie? Because again, when I was there, there was a lot of rumor about your movie. It's only I had the impression a lot of people were talking about it and they put some hopes into it. And yeah. again, wake yeah. up more people. So what was the official response from Lebanese government? Well, was there any? It's with the censors at the moment. The, none of the government has seen it unless somebody's privately given it to them, which they're not allowed to. It's being, you know, it's going through censorship to see if it will get approved. So we'll have our answer, I hope, by the end of the week. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we get to screen it in Lebanon to the Lebanese in theatres and we have a big opening and we can be honest and open about the reality, but I'm not sure how with the, you know, the regime here, the elite political and business elite, whether they're willing to have their faces and their names, um, you know, shown in a, dis, in, a, in a manner that is dis, uh, you know, it's very unfavorable, shall we say. It's reality. I'm letting them do the talking, but they don't come off looking very good. So we'll find out um, very soon if it gets approved by the censors or it will be banned in Lebanon. So that's, that's the big headline right now. Will this film be banned in Lebanon? Will the film be banned? So we're, you know, there's a couple of things. They may not ban it because they don't want to give it extra publicity. If it gets banned, it'll get more publicity, which is great for us, but it's great for us either way. Um, you know, I, I want to be able to have a launch and an event in Lebanon. Um, if it's banned, well, we'll have to do the launch somewhere else and we'll do it in Australia. We'll have a, an online launch for Lebanon because we'll stream it, you know. It can't, they can't stop us showing it to the Lebanese, so it will be screened to them. Um, yeah. Good luck for that. Do you think it's going to be out here in some European movie and theater cinema complexes as well? Is this planned? I think I was reading that it should be out in the Arabic world as well. That's right. Yes, we've just signed on with a distributor for the MENA region, Middle East and North African region. And they're planning to um, release it in either late November or early December in cinemas across the Middle East, not Lebanon. Lebanon, if it gets approved, will be released later in 2022, like in February of 2022 because of the Which elections. Will be before time. the elections, right? The elections, when will take place? At the moment, the date is the 8th of May, 2022. The government might change their mind, but we'll see. 
at the moment that's that that's the date so when the the very important dates for Lebanese outside Lebanon the diaspora anyone living in Germany or France or any country that's not an Arab country the voting day for them is the 24th of April it's two weeks prior to the election so and anyone and in an I Arab think country very important because I think um, you said once the diaspora is a sleeping giant which means yes. that those who are living abroad, they should go for yeah. voting. Yeah, they should feel a responsibility for voting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and they need to register now. They have a window to register only up until the 20th of November. Mm -hmm. So they need to go to their embassy or their consulate and register to be able to vote next year. So there's a lot of issues around the government. We're not sure what they're gonna do, whether they're gonna stop the diaspora. There's real threat that the government in Lebanon is trying to silence the Lebanese diaspora. They're trying to steal our voice and steal our vote. So we need Lebanese across the diaspora and people who believe in democracy to you know, voice their disapproval and stand up against the government's tactics to prevent our voice being heard. Daisy, what is there to say? Amazing, amazing. I so love your energy. And even more than that, the motivation and the values you are standing for. I think this is so crucial for the world, for each of us, to have like role models like you are. So let yeah. me just say the name of the documentary again. It is Enough, explanation mark. Lebanese darkest hour and I think what you said is that's a movie to wake up it's something that is not just important in Lebanon it's important no matter where you are right now living and it tackles different issues right it tackles like the state corruption that not only is happening in Lebanon the mismanagement of governmental institution also this is I think a global issue and the embezzlement of funds for example mm -hmm. so Daisy where can we find you? I will also write it down in the show notes, but if someone who's right now listening say, oh, I wanna know more about your work, where can they connect with you? Look, you know, if you just use my name, Daisy Gideon, on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube, you can find me. I also have my own website, daisygideon.com. Um, you just got to spell the name right. So it's Daisy with a Z, not an S, D-A-I-Z-Y, <laughs> and Gideon, you know, so G-E-D-E-O-N, but um, you could put that in. But um, I love listening and responding to people. I get a lot of engagement on Instagram and Facebook and um, LinkedIn, and I love responding to people from all over the world, South America, Africa, Europe, a lot of people from Europe and USA, um, and of course, Australia. So I, I, I really in, encourage people to reach out to me because I'm not a stuck up, closed off kind of person. And I really want to know how you feel and what your, what your interpretation is because you're the people, you are people, we all need to be working together. And if I can, if this work touches you, it, it, it resonates for you, I'm very happy to, to engage with you and, and somehow, you know, learn from you as well, because I've learned from many people. Yeah. Daisy. Thank, Thank you, you so much. From my heart. I Karina. so enjoyed that hour with you. I learned a lot and I'm really very Thank touched. You. And I'm already looking forward to meeting you in person, no matter where it's going to be. Maybe even Australia, back in Beirut, or here, Berlin, Munich, wherever. We stay in touch. Oh, Thank absolutely. you so much, everybody who has been listening today. It was a really, very interesting session. Thank you again. And of course, I will write down all the information about you in the show notes. Keep on shining. Thank you and stay democratic. All the best for you and the publishment of your documentary. I cross my fingers. Thank you. Thank you so much for this platform to speak about my film and my purpose. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you. Thank you.